Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Peace Production. Thank you so much, Adam, um, and thank you so much to PACE for uh, the real privilege of being able to make work like this um, in the middle of the country. It's a real gift to have a space of this size and the support of amazing people like Adam to make installations like this happen. So thank you very, very much. Um, it took me a long time to figure out what to look at when I moved to the middle of the country. I grew up in Colorado, and I thought I knew what majesty looked like from seeing snow-capped mountains on the horizon all year long. Now, when I think of majesty, I think of scenes like this, a sunset from Toadstool Geologic Park in northeastern Nebraska. This is one of the least populated parts of the state, and this campground is an hour's drive down a deeply rutted one-lane road. With no town lights reflecting on the horizon, I've seen the Milky Way more clearly here than anywhere else on Earth. When people ask me about the landscape in, quote, flyover country, I tell them that there is as much species diversity in the eight feet of tall grass prairie as there is in the great redwood forest. You just have to know how to look for it. And if you want majesty, the sky here is second to none. Toadstool is an ancient migratory route. The geology is a soft sandstone of volcanic ash. Animals followed this waterway, and the footprints of pigs, camels, and gigantic tortoises have been preserved in this bedrock. As the soft soil is washed away, fossils are revealed. I discovered these fossilized deer hoof bones while camping the first summer of the pandemic. I was able to identify them because they are identical to the hooves of the deer that I find near I-80. I put my body in places where I find these deer because at 120 pounds, the deer are the same size as me. When I'm lying in the spaces where they live and die, I'm developing empathy for them and locating my place in time and in the interconnected system of the natural world. I've been gathering deer bones for eight years. When I hold up their spines, they are the same length as mine. And when their flesh is gone, their hair is left behind, a memorial that reminds me that they are mammals like us. It also reminds me of the hair of a loved one, saved in a locket or a braid after they've passed. The work in this gallery is titled Verge. I use this word to name the physical and emotional space of this work. As a noun, it defines the strip of land beside a highway, which is the site my work engages. As a verb, it describes the emotional space of my engagement, to approach the edge of something, often an emotion, as to be on the verge of tears. The question I'm asking of this verge is what happens in this wild space? The response I get is complicated, in a way that reflects our contemporary location in the natural world. Here, where I gather deer remains, I find stands of native bromes and grasses, invasive species, flocks of turkeys, waterways, abandoned furniture, and trash. When a semi passes, the space can be dangerous, deafening, and sometimes surprisingly beautiful. The postures these deer hold in death remind me of Renaissance paintings. Figures caught in ecstasy, their heads thrown back, or saints crying out in agony, their mouths open, their heads tucked. If the deer are fresh, I take them to a restored prairie and put them under chicken wire for a season. I then return a season later to cut back the grass and bring the bones to the studio. If the bones are fresh, or I'm sorry, if the bones are relatively clean, I can start the process of washing them right away. In this image taken by Barry Phipps, I'm carrying water from a slough to a cast iron bathtub in a farm field where I'm washing a set of bones. These magical images reflect the spirit of cleansing, care, and penance that makes this work. Back in the studio, I soak these bones in 48 hour cycles of hydrogen peroxide. This cleans any microbes from them and returns them to their primary mineral state. When they are clean and dry, I make molds of them. 
Supported by an artist residency at UCROSS in Wyoming in the fall of 2019, I completed molds for all 114 bones in a deer body. Some of these molds are more complicated than others. The day I was finally able to make this skull cast work was such a triumph. Imagine a really intricate bundt cake that you have to get out of the pan. This material, the skull I made of the mold is in the background and the one that looks like chocolate is in the foreground. That is the cast wax replica. This material transformation is important to me as an artist and as a naturalist. The bones that I started this lecture with have been transformed by thousands of years of heat and pressure into stone. I am making wax replicas of these same bones so that I can cast them out of glass. Material transformation has always been important to me as, as an artist. I moved to Iowa in 2001 to study hand paper making with Tim Barrett at the University of Iowa Center for the Book. Paper is plant fiber, flax, cotton, hemp, or mulberry that is cooked and then beaten into a pulp. This pulp is then dispersed in water and strained through a mesh frame to create a sheet of paper. The translation from plant to pulp to paper has always felt magical to me, like turning flour and water into bread. Once the fiber is dry, it can be peeled off the frame. I spoke earlier about trying to find my place in the system of the natural world. One of the things I think about a lot as an artist is the system or pattern that makes up the structure of all things. Over the years, I've taken thousands of images like these, the pattern of leaf veins, cicada and dragonfly wings, and marrow inside a deer bone. I see these images everywhere. These patterns provide a structure to these organisms, but they're also reminiscent of superstructures, like a river system seen from space. Patterns like these have also always been used for adornment, such as in this lace bustle or corset. Using a syringe of paper pulp, I drew this pattern on an eight-foot screen. The image on the left is the paper in process, and the image on the right is the paper dried. I had already been experimenting with wearing a deer hide and photographing myself in places where deer live. I wanted to make the hide in the shape of my body to see what it was to truly stand with this form. The hide on the left is one I tanned from a local bow hunt and the, and the figure on the right is my body cast in duct tape and newspaper. Here is the tanned hide fitted to the form drying in the studio. This object is the only human in the exhibition, the lacy pattern forming the interior and system of the body. Sections of the paper and hide are adorned with white gold and silver. I love that the shadow on the ground also references the original network. I've talked about working with the bones and placing my body in the spaces where deer live and die, but a major component of what's happening in this gallery is the installation. Installations, rather than traditional exhibitions, engage the entire space as a component of the work. The artist Ilya Kabakov said of this style of art that the main actor in the total installation, the main center toward which everything is addressed, for which everything is intended, is the viewer. I truly built this space with all of you in mind. Looking at this image, I want you to think about the highway itself and notice some elements of this space and what it means to place our bodies here. The lines on the floor that subdivide this beautiful room are the exact size, shape, and materials of an American highway. Each dash that we drive past at 70 miles an hour is 10 feet long, with 30 feet in between. Each highway lane is 16 feet wide. The road paint that reflects your headlights and makes these dashes visible at night is made of thousands and thousands of tiny glass beads. The image on the left is a material test to see how the Department of Transportation beads worked on medical felt with white and yellow paint in the gallery. These tests and many others were created by the artists Abby and Carly Lowe who run the studio Hat on a Hat in St. Louis. Here are Abby and I moving one of the dashes in the gallery and an image of several dashes drying together and reflecting the light. I've been encouraging people to think about how different these highway lanes feel than a parking lot stall. 
I also think about how it would feel to see a vehicle or a semi-truck approaching in this space. Marking or memorializing the physical spaces where deer die is an important part of this work. When I return to a carcass after a year of the insects doing their work, there is an intricate pattern left in the earth underneath them. Using this photograph, Hat on a Hat was able to produce this repeating pattern on the right. I wanted to think through a series of material tests to see how this pattern might work in the space of the gallery. This slide shows a range of tests, the pattern cut into felt, embroidered onto fabric and leather, and beaded with glass and semi-precious stones. All this time I was thinking about the highway and what to do once I had the lanes built into this space. The solution came through a chance recording from a dash cam video on a family vacation. This is a still from a video shot on I-80. On the left side of the image, you can see the stain on the highway from a recent deer strike. Working through a frame-by-frame -frame edit of this footage, we were able to scale the totality of the deer strike. It covered nearly a quarter mile. We were able to lay it out in the gallery. Here is the original strike map made for the, with the scale of the stains. In the spirit of transformation, I wanted to work the material tests beyond something digital. I wanted them to feel handmade again. The results were putting the felt patterns on an overhead projector and hand tracing them onto black Tyvek. They were then hand cut by Abby. We then combined some of the strike sets with an image of tire tread and covered the strikes with glass beads. This reflective network indicates the scale of a road accident. When my friend Rachel Yoder came to see this show, she said, it feels like the shape of their souls. This pattern is used in other ways in this exhibition. I've been experimenting with cyanotype, a late 1800s alternative photography method that fixes a bright blue image to any surface when it's exposed to light. Architectural blueprints are made this way. Here is a bone wrapped in the pattern and chemicals applied in the makeshift darkroom of my studio. The bone is exposed to sunlight in a reflective snowbank and then washed to reveal a bright blue pattern. These marks feel so related to the way our imprints are left on the world. These tire tracks and doe and fawn tracks were just inches from each other on a newly paved road this summer. I wanted to capture the shape and pattern of the tires that facilitate these impacts, so I made a rubber mold and a plaster replica and filled it with glass powder, very similar to the reflective glass that's used in the road stripes and fired the whole thing in a kiln. This process made the glass castings that feel like snow. As you can see from this presentation so far, sculpture is a slow process, <laughs> and it's also really technical. It has a huge failure rate, and it's really hard to do by yourself. I've been learning about glass casting for years through books and tutorials, but I really moved forward after a class this summer at the Penland School of Crafts, taught by Nisha Banzel and assisted by John Dillard. This photo is the last day of the class when I got my first really perfect bone cast. I was so excited I could hardly stand it. This summer I also made the transition from a 16-year career as a sculpture professor to working full-time as an artist. Here is my studio at 22nd and Leavenworth where all this work happened. Here I am in the studio altering wax casts to heal bones that have been damaged or are missing from road accidents. The process is slow and meticulous. It's like I'm making prosthetics. Sometimes a very large section of bone is missing and the waxwork takes a lot of time to Frankenstein together. Once I have a good fitting wax, I prepare the form for investment. It needs to have gates, the green tubes, to prevent air bubbles from forming. Investing requires me to coat the wax with many layers of a mixture of plaster and silica. I'm wearing a particulate respirator to protect me from this dust. I'm also working outside for ventilation. 
Here I am painting the layers of plaster onto the wax form. The silica isn't airborne here, so I don't need to wear the respirator anymore, but the material sets so fast there isn't time to take it off. Once the form is finished, I fit it to a hose hooked to a wallpaper steamer to remove the wax from inside the investment. Covering the form with plastic helps keep it all hot and get all the wax out. Here is the form sitting in the kiln ready for firing. This is a kiln here at Pace. It was such a privilege to be able to use these kilns in making some of this work. Once the form is level at the top, I top it with a flower pot filled with glass. As the kiln heats, the glass melts through the hole in the flower pot into the form below. A firing like this can take up to 65 hours. The investment is very fragile once the cast is cool and breaks away easily and then can then be washed in vinegar to remove any of the last bits. In the image here, you can see the gating has been partially cast also. The form is then cold worked with a small diamond saw to remove any of the trace bits. These are some of the cast forms and the glass repairs to the bones. Here's a pelvis, one half with a glass repair and the other a clean polished bone. Sometimes the repairs are very thin, like in these shoulder blades. The pieces have to be fit and epoxied together. Then I gild the connection between the bone and the glass with white gold. These skeletons are then reassembled in the gallery. I couldn't have completed this installation without help from many of the people in this room. It is important to me that the skeletons are standing on two legs so that they feel more like us. They feel vulnerable in this position. We are in a time of climate crisis together. Though I sometimes despair, I value the complication of this time. These skeletons are so like ours, and yet we are the primary predator for these deer. The herd in Nebraska and Iowa grows exponentially because they graze on the feed corn that we grow. They migrate less and grow larger every year. Deer are a precious symbol of the American wilderness, and their primary protectors are the hunting community. In the 1890s, they were nearly hunted to extinction, and now they are so overpopulated, herds are being sterilized, and teams of sharpshooters hunt them in the suburbs. 1.2 million road accidents a year are caused by deer, and 200 humans die in the US every year as a result. I want to end with this quote from Teresita Fernandez, that making art is like blindly trying to understand the shape of what you don't know yet. Whenever you catch a glimpse of the blind spot of your unknown, don't be afraid or embarrassed to stare at it. Instead, try to relish in its profound mystery. Art is taking the risk of engaging in something somewhat ridiculous and irrational, simply because you need to get a closer look at it. You simply need to break it open and see what's inside. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I look forward to questions and conversation.